Today I'm going to go through the drone safety and certifications in Canada. This is for APST 87 and 142, which is our survey field camp in the Geographic Information Systems program at Fleming College. Topics I'm going to go through include uh, how drones have had a severe amount of problems recently uh, around improper use and regulations have been implemented to try and actually solve that as well as a look at some future opportunities to improve those regulations through technology and safety and I'll go through the basics about how to fly it. First and foremost drones are dangerous they're not toys. You can see here this drone is actually cutting through a vegetable and there's a video at the bottom that goes through in detail about how you can basically use it as a food dicer. So the blades themselves are designed to cut through the air and are quite lightweight and rigid. So they can act like knives when they're traveling at high speeds, which they do travel around at many thousands of RPMs. And as you can see here, it can cut right through fruits, flesh, which you can only imagine what that's gonna do potentially to your uh, yourselves. So it's not a good idea to have um, a drone operating in an area where there might be uh, it hitting somebody or something. Now, in the aviation community, you can see here this little video shows a drone impacting an actual wing and it actually damages the wing itself in fairly severely. Now this was done in 2018 by the University of Dayton. And you can see the full video below, but this really just does summarize what you're seeing. The, um, the actual drone is fired at, um, in a controlled situation at a wing, and it impacts the wing and actually penetrates the aluminum, damaging it severely. Now, uh, the researchers conclude that this likely would not have taken the airplane down um, in this case, but it did do severe damage to the wing uh, which likely would require an emergency landing and uh, potentially have other issues. So it's important to understand um, that drones can be quite dangerous, both to the aviation community as well to, uh, to people. Now in Canada from 2005 to 2016, a researcher mapped the number, or graphed rather, the number of uh, occurrences which were reported to Transport Canada. And you can see the spike after 2013. And that's just simply because drones became inexpensive and quite popular. And in particular, if you look at the close encounters with aircraft, so it's uh, 79 occurrences. As well, you have um, the um, number of accidents that have actually occurred at 22 during this uh, entire period. It's, uh, it's, it's getting quite um, challenging to manage this and the, the factors are going up which increases the probability of having more accidents. So definitely something that the, uh, the governing bodies recognize that needed to be solved. Now there's things going all throughout the world about drones and these are the little personal ones. These aren't things that are like military grade. At Heathrow last Christmas they had a severe impact to their operations because of uh, drones being sighted. So they actually literally closed the airport uh, because they didn't want an aircraft to be impacted by a drone. So if this is going to occur, um, you're going to have uh, severe economic and issues with individuals traveling. So there, it's a criminal offense to do uh, to impact aviation. So. Uh, they're really trying to find and crack down on these types of people that operate drones near airports. They've actually even developed new policing units to um, figure out where the drones are and uh, uh, go get them. And I've even seen some really cool um, training techniques of animals. So for example, they've used birds of prey to actually go and grab the drone right out of the sky and uh, are able to do that. Now, with the policing side of things, it's really important to understand if you're going to be impacting a drone to make it no longer functioning, it's going to fall out of the sky potentially. 
And if it does that, it's going to potentially impact someone or something or property. The reason you're actually uh, trying to go after the drone is because it's already doing something. So if you're going to be doing um, this in a, um, a scenario for uh, um, where it needs to come down, it's going to, you might actually do more damage than just leaving it up there. So it's, it's a real concern here for how to uh, deal with drones. Now, Canada is no, not immune to this. There's been 33 incidents in Ontario alone since January and uh, the end of June. And end of June marks a special occasion in 2019 because that's when the regulations were implemented. Um, and the new regulations I'm going to go through soon. So let's just talk about the regulations around the world. Now, first and foremost, the regulations I'm looking at here uh, are the new ones for Canada. And uh, how do they exist throughout the world in comparison to the new regulations? So first of all, you have operations over people. And this simply means you're flying over somebody. And Canada does have regulations or limitations on that. US doesn't, and Australia does not. They don't have any uh, regulations. You can fly over people, no issues. Urban areas, you can see the UK has that. Um, insurance side of things, there really isn't anything in Canada, US, UK, or Australia. And then the speed limits. I'd love to see what the speed limits are like with drones in the US, EU, and the UK, uh, but Canada does not have those. Age restrictions, proximity to airports, which is what an aerodrome is. Maximum altitude, uh, pretty much everybody has that limitation, so you can't go up too high. And then how far away it can be from you as well. So you can uh, get a basic understanding of how the regulations line up with Canada and the rest of the world's uh, first uh, or G7 countries. Now, the new drones were implemented, as I said, our new drone rules were implemented in early June. And this requires that you have a pilot certificate, that the drone be um, registered, um, you have to avoid airports, and uh, the other thing, it's the, the way the CBC reported it, is no drunk droning. Um, I don't think that was a big problem, but if it was, obviously you can't do it anymore. So um, we'll, we'll go through those regulations in a second, but it's important to understand that these regulations were implemented in response to the uptick in a number of drones and occurrences that were occurring. Now, there's a quick video here that I'll show. And uh, um, for those of you uh, viewing this video, um, you should have watched this already. If you haven't, pause the video and go watch this video, which gives you a very basic understanding in uh, two and a half minutes of what the uh, regulations were implemented in the beginning of June. With that being said, let me just summarize them. So first and foremost, you need to have a pilot certificate. And there's two types of pilot certificates. There's basic and advanced. Now the basic one basically means you cannot operate near or over people, and you can't fly in, un, uh, un, you can only fly in controlled, uncontrolled airspace. So only where there is not uh, air traffic control. You need an advanced certificate if you want to fly over people or in air traffic control, but you still need air traffic control approval. So I'll go through the basics about this and give you an understanding of how potentially you can not only understand these regulations, but even earn your basic operations pilot certificate. Now, there is this other type called a SFOC or Special Flight Operations Certificate. Before the regulations got implemented in beginning of June in 2019, you had to have an SFOC pretty much for anything you were doing with a drone which became really cumbersome and the regulatory bodies, in particular Transport Canada, was really struggling to keep up with the number of requests. So these uh, legal implemented um, rules and uh, regulations allow you to operate without having to get this, but you still need this for particular um, occasions. And, it, and a SFOC can be issued over a blanket amount of time. It could be blank uh, for a specific event it can be issued to an uh, authority for um, a duration, for example, to a fire department or police department in a particular city for, the, uh, for many years, or it can be issued to an individual o over a specific events time horizon. So let's say um, a sporting event or uh, a rally or something like a news agency. So if it's an advertised event, and the definition of advertised event isn't really clear, but basically if it's publicly known, you need an SFOC. If your drone is over 25 kilograms, you need an FSOC. 
And if you are trying to operate over 400 feet or out of line of sight, it's not mentioned here, but out of line of sight, then you need an FSOC. So these are um, very particular um, types of operations. And basically, they just want to review things a little bit more detailed. So let's go through the individual components of the basic, advanced, and then SFOC. So first of all, airports or controlled airspace, you have to stay away from airports with a basic operation certificate, and you also have to uh, stay away from heliports. So uh, three nautical miles and one nautical mile, uh, respectively. And you're not allowed in controlled airspaces, and I'll discuss what controlled airspaces are in a little bit. Now, if you have your advanced operations, you're allowed in these places, but you have to have ATC approval. And the way you get ATC approval is you actually call them and tell them what you're going to be doing and they give you that approval. Or if you have a radio operator's license for aviation, you can actually issue it directly against ATC's uh, um, um, frequencies. But generally speaking, you can do it by phone. Now, people, obviously, um, advanced operations, you can fly over people, but you still need to stay away from them. It's 15 uh, feet away um, is the, the minimum. And uh, with a basic, you have to stay at least 100 feet away from bystanders. Now, a bystander is somebody that is not part of the operation. So you are part of the actual flight crew, we'll call it, by controlling it. So obviously, you, you will be within 100 feet of it. And you sometimes might even have people that are assigned to help you be spotters. And those people also are part of the operations, can, then can be within that, uh, that frame. But you must not fly over people with the basic operations. Now, um, the SFOC might be required um, to implement, be implemented to override the people side, because obviously, uh, if you have a large event, Advertised events are not allowed in the basic or advanced. It has to be an FSOC. Um, so parades, concerts, sporting events, they're listing a whole bunch of stuff. So anything that's an advertised event, they're really saying. Um, maximum altitude in the basic and advanced is uh, 400 feet. Altitude over buildings. Um, maximum 100 feet when within 60 or 200 feet of buildings. So they actually even limit it a little bit more. So you can't go over 100 feet of the building's height. Um, when you're within 200 feet of the building. Um, parks, uh, historical sites, and other things that are uh, owned and operated by Parks Canada, you pretty much are not permitted to use any drone without special permission. So they're being very clear. Now, every organization will have their own drone uh, regulations, and they should be clearly identified when you enter a facility. Um, if not, you should probably be asking if it's private property. So uh, Parks is just one example. Because these are federal regulations, they're not provincial. Obviously, Parks Canada is federal as well, so they've included that within this. Okay, so let's take a look at what you need to be able to get um, your basic or advanced certificate, um, uh, pilot certificate. So both have online exams. They're both open book. And you just have to do it on your own, and you have to do it within the time frame that is there. Um, number of questions is 35 for the basic and 50 for the multiple choice, or, or sorry, 50 for the advanced, which are both multiple choice. Now the time limit's interesting. You'll notice that even though the basic has less questions, it gives you a, a fair amount of time, 90 minutes. You can almost learn what it's asking as you're doing the actual test. Uh, whereas the advanced, you really need to do a little bit more studying. You only have 60 minutes to answer all 50 multiple choice questions. You also need at least an 80% on the advanced and 65 on the basic. So the 65%, it's fairly easy to get. Every attempt you do is $10. And you can do this as many times as you'd like to be able to earn at least a 65 or 80%. But you have to wait 24 hours between each exam. The results, you get them immediately. And I'm going to show you what the results look like. There's uh, a variety of um, information that it gives you. And I'll also give you some of the basics that you need to be able to get the basic operations um, certificate. And we're also going to look at a little bit of uh, some of the criticism around this. Now, if you wanted to 
read more about how to actually earn your basic operations, I've linked to a video on the slide which goes through the basic operations test and gives you a primer. And uh, although I'm, I'm going to give you some of the basics right now. So let's just go through the, uh, the overall items. So first of all, from the drone's point of view, it's 250 grams to 25 kilograms is what you have to have when you're operating the basic or advanced. If it's over 25, you need to have an SFOC. 25 kilograms is fairly heavy though, so the likelihood of you having something that heavy is not very likely. But if it's less than 250 grams, basically a paper airplane, you don't have to have it registered. You can actually play with it outside without any registration. Now the drone itself also has to be registered and marked with a registration number when you get the, when you do the registration, you get it. So this is very similar to um, the airplane registration numbers or a boat registration number. It's a big long number that you put on the drone itself. And basic operations, you can use any drone. Even if you home make it, it can be basic, uh, used in basic. However, advanced operations have to be on an approved list for you to use it. So you're not gonna be able to just build your own homemade drones. You'll have to get them approved to be able to fly under advanced operations. Now the pilot, you, uh, you just need to be certified to use the basic operations. So basically, uh, you just take the test and you're, you're able to go. Um, you have to be at least 14 years old or under supervised uh, supervision of a supervised or certified pilot. Wow, I can't read. <laughs> the, the pilot uh, for an advanced operation, so it has to be at least 16 years or, uh, or older. They also need to pass a flight review. You'll notice that the flight review is listed right here. So a flight review is somebody observing your entire process of the planning, execution of the flight, and then post uh, reporting of all the data associated with the flight. Because you have to record everything. Every single flight you do, you must record, whether it be basic or advanced. So there's a, a log books that you have to have for this. So not only do you need to get the certification, but you also need to pass the flight review for advanced operations. Now the pilot themselves will go through that. And uh, what is not mentioned here under the pilot is every two years or 24 months, you have to have some type of renewal. Now that hasn't been very clearly set out what a renewal is, whether it be, for example, just retaking the certification tests or is it doing additional training? So there's um, not a lot of clarity about what, uh, what that means. Um, another point is you cannot drink or be under the influence of drugs within 12 hours of flying. So there's certain even over-the-counter uh, medications like cold medications that actually con are considered banned in the aviation industry. This is pretty much the same rule that you have for flying a normal airplane. So uh, the rules here are really in line with what a pilot needs to do for a fixed wing or um, a, a helicopter type aircraft. Now, what can you do with the, the drone itself? Um, you have to keep it in sight at all times. So you must ma maintain visual line of sight at all times. Now, if you have a drone that is using first person view goggles, so you literally put goggles on and you can see as if you're sitting in the drone, you can do that, but then you need to have a visual person watching it. And the drone itself will have to be watched at all times by that observer and they have to be X distance from you so that they can communicate with you. You can even fly at night, it's just you have to have the correct red, green and flashing lights on the actual drone to be able to do that. So the special uh, flight operation certificate you'll see pretty much can um, do anything as long as you get approval. So that's why um, uh, the most operations can be basic or advanced with sometimes being uh, required to get an FFOC. Okay, so let's talk about what you need to know to be able to pass the basic um, pilot's certification. So you need to know terminology, and there's lots of terminology here because this is a legal framework and regulatory framework that has very specific meanings by different things. So what is visual line of sight, for example? 
Now there's aviation terms as well as aerodrome, airport, heliport. These things mean different things in different contexts, but in the aviation terms, they're defined using the regulations and there's two references associated with that, the car and the aim, and I'll show you those in a second. Now there's all these car references in 901, and that's actually a single document. So drone registration requirements, line of sight, flight restrictions, operating rules around airports, flight restrictions around emergency areas and forest fires, flight restrictions around people, advertised events, structures, how much stuff or payload you can put on the drone itself and its weight, and how to give way to manned aircraft, so anything that is actually flying. So all of these are defined in these rules that really came into effect in June of 2019. So let's take a look at what those are after I just show you what you get. So this is my pilot certificate with a couple of things blurred out and I, I'm certified under basic operations. So this is what I'd have to have printed and with me if I was operating a drone and I'd have to obviously work within the rules and regulations um, under what I am doing. So you can see there's specific rules of what it must have, including the actual regulation number that's associated with that. Here's what my exam results look like. Now, when I took this exam, I actually didn't think I would pass because I was just going to try it quickly and I just wanted to see the process one time, but I ended up getting 91. So I, it, it's not too difficult to do this is what I'm saying. So. The basic operations is sort of like getting your driver's test. Um, you, you first have to go and just do a written exam first before you can even touch the wheel of a car. That's almost what the basic is like. So you do that and then you can actually start playing with your drone and getting used to how to use it, likely crash it, have some issues and come back. So um, I went through all of these different items and you can see where I've made mistakes. I've made uh, three mistakes. And uh, one was under air law, air traffic rules and procedures. Another one was under airframes, power plants, propulsion and systems. And then the last one is meteorology. The meteorology one was just an oddly worded question. I should have known it, but I just didn't answer correctly, obviously. So I got all of these um, correct answers because I have a background in aviation. I've flown real aircraft before, so I have some basis of that. Um, but then just going through and reading the rules, it's open book. So if you know where to look, you can actually find the information pretty quickly. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what you would get when you do the exam. So here's some sample questions. These are not actual questions from the exam. These are just examples that I've created based on what I saw during the exam. So an example might be, what information can you be found on the VFR terminal area maps? So on the basic exam, you have 90 minutes. So you could go look this up during but you need to know where to look to be able to find this information. So this would be on the AIM. That's where you'd actually go and look for it. And I'll show you what the AIM is in a, in a minute. It's a big, thick book. The next is what airspace can you operate with a basic operations certificate? And this is in the, um, in the regulations that were actually implemented in uh, beginning of June of 2019. So you'd have to know how to look up the legal information to be able to determine what this is. And the questions, when they give them to you, it's multiple choice. You have to select the best option and then you move on to the next question. And so it's, it's pretty simple, pretty fast to be able to do. Um, in the 90 minutes um, that I had, I probably only used about 20 of it and I was looking up questions as I went through. Okay, so here's the Transport Canada Airport Aeronautical Information Manual. Sorry, not airport. Aeronautical Information Manual is something that every pilot uses to be able to understand all of the signage and regulations and um, procedures associated with operating an aircraft within Canada. So this is a free download or it's a big book you can purchase. It is published twice a year. This version you can see was uh, became um, active October 10th. So it's actually a fairly new version and it goes for about six months. So you have the exact dates and times because airplanes can be in the air at any time that this is uh, valid. And you'll notice it uses Zulu time, which is basically universal uh, time. So it's like Greenwich Mean Time. So you can download that. I provided the link, and that way you can use this as one resource. So when I took the test, I had this open with a PDF, and that way I could search and find what I wanted as quickly as I possibly could using it. So that's one resource. Now the second resource, if you're not familiar with Canadian law, 
whenever you get changes to different uh, laws, you get these kind of summaries of those changes. So in particular, this summary uh, from this particular date contains all of the information that is related just to the drones. So it's a really nice compact version of the, um, of the regulations that were implemented in the Aviation Acts and other acts. So in particular, this has 900 to 922 of the uh, Transport Canada Aviation Acts, and it's, um, it's quite complex to try to piece it out of the existing regulations because this is embedded with you know, flying a real aircraft. But this version, this uh, Canadian Gazette uh, version, does contain everything you need to know as it was implemented. Now, going forward, if there's amendments, this uh, Canada Gazette then might need to have a little bit of uh, amendments to it. So it's important to research and understand exactly what the current regulations are at time. And as it is current in October of 2019, this one document does contain all the regulations you need um, for the legal framework that were implemented and asked for with respect to the testing. Okay, so this is the Canadian Aviation Regulations. And there's a PDF and HTML version. So when I took the test, I had the PDF version up and I was able to search through it to find the information I wanted. Now, I did browse through this before I took the test as well. That was about the hour of studying, just so I can understand what was there. And again, I have a bit of a background in aviation. I'm not a pilot, but I have a background. So I was able to understand a little bit more of it than maybe just uh, um, a, an average person might. So uh, I, I encourage you to read this through before you go through the actual test. Okay, so let's talk about actually using a drone. It talks about where you can operate. Now, um, National Research Council of Canada actually implemented a really nice, simple website that allows you to go and find where you can fly. So this tool contains all of Canada, and you can um, zoom in on different areas. So let's zoom in on Park Lake area. And you'll notice that I am lost. Where is Irondale? Where am oh, Irondale right here? So Bark Lake is in this area. So you can see there's no restrictions on a flying. So that just simply means there's uh, no airports and no restrictions. So I can use a basic operation certificate as long as I'm not flying over people or over an event or again, following the other parts of the rules. I can actually fly in this area. However, right over Minden, you'll see there's a hospital there. And that's a heliport. And it was, uh, I believe it was um, uh, two nautical miles uh, within the airport, or sorry, one nautical mile of the airport, which is like just under two kilometers, that you cannot fly in it. And so this is a simple buffer of that location. So by no means is this exact, but at least gives you a basic understanding of where you can and cannot fly. Now, if I go over here, and I click on this one, you can see drone operations are permitted, but you need to uh, use caution because this is, there, there might be seaplane traffic in this area. So that's, it that gives you an understanding. Now, if we go over um, the Lindsay campus of Fleming College, you can see that there is, oops, there is some restrictions on it because of, there is an aerodrome close to here. So again, we need to make sure um, that we're not impacting the operation of that aerodrome and Fleming College is actually bisected by that. Now if we look at the Toronto area and the Golden Horseshoe you can see there's a lot of restrictions because there's many airports and a lot of flight operations are in that area. So basically the Toronto area is almost all restricted so basic operations are not permitted. Now this tool does give you the option to set up how this is going to work. So you can actually say, I'm not using ba uh, basic, I'm using advanced operations. And it just basically recolors things. So now it says, if you click on this, it says, uh, this is class C controlled airspace, advanced RPA um, operations are only permitted within zone of inflicted in orange. Um, and you need permission from the operating authority to be able to do that. So you have to get ATC approval. So this gives you a clear understanding of what uh, and who is restricting things. So airspace Buttonville, airspace Toronto, airspace Toronto Lester B, up here is uh, Borden, 
Um, and you, so that way you can get an understanding of where and when you can fly uh, based on these. But by no means is this an exhaustive list. There are other restrictions that may occur in a, any given time, which the regulations would uh, uh, define for you. So the AIM gives you the, the um, NOTAMS method. So the drone selection tool is a nice simple tool just to be able to get a basic understanding of where uh, you can fly. But it is a basic understanding and it's not a comprehensive list. Okay, let's talk about airspace in Canada just briefly. Now from a drone's flying point of view, you know you can't fly over 400 uh, feet above ground level or AGL. So 400 feet means you're below the 700 feet. So basically you're down here. So the only time you have to really worry about uh, where you can or cannot fly is in a controlled zone, a class F, which is military, a class E, which is another type of controlled zone, and a class F uh, for parachuting potentially. Other than that, you can fly. So it's pretty wide open. And you saw that on that example website most of Ontario you could fly. It's just in areas where you have a control zone, so something like this, a terminal control area, or a control area extension. So airspace in Canada, it's pretty easy to, to fly. Now, if you're trying to navigate using uh, real mapping, this is the type of map you'd have to use if you were trying to determine where you can fly. And it, you can see it gets pretty exhaustive. Uh, this map here is for visual flight uh, rules over the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And it shows you VFR procedures as well as who to contact for different items. So if you had a um, uh, radio operator's license for aviation, you could actually use this to determine who you can call to ask uh, if, if you can fly or not in that in, in particular area using an advanced operation certificate. So it gives you the actual um, uh, frequencies to be able to, to call, um, as well as the uh, uh, navigation frequencies uh, for the DME, which is just uh, a way to navigate. So it gives you lots of information, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than what we need just to fly a drone. So that's why that other website is a little bit more useful. Okay, one of the biggest criticisms of these new regulations is the tests really are testing you about the legal framework. It's not about actually flying a drone. If you've ever taken the boaters test to be able to get your uh, pleasure craft operator's license, this is a pretty similar type of framework. This is a legal framework. In this, in this case, it actually fits into the aviation industry's existing legal framework and regulations. And because of that, it does seem a little bit odd being asked questions about flight theory when you just want to fly a drone. But it does make sense that they want to make sure you have a good understanding of what is happening with the drone uh, before you can actually go fly it. Okay, so let's talk about some drone and aviation future, future possibilities here to be able to um, improve on the safety now, this isn't implemented yet, but this is a potential. So watch this video here, and you can see this aircraft, this helicopter, actually approaching and passing a, a flying drone. Now, in this case, the drone itself is flying less than 400 uh, feet above sea level. In this case, you can see the sea right there. It's not flying over people. It's operating uh, maybe advanced, but even likely under the basic rules. But you still had a helicopter or a real aircraft approach and fly by very quickly. Now the drone operator did see it coming at the last minute and you can see him kind of move out or her move out away from the, the drone or from the helicopter. So they actually did try to do a little bit of avoidance, but they only had a couple of seconds between the time that they saw it coming and uh, when they actually moved. So this is concerning. So who's in the right here? Well, I'm not uh, going to comment on the legalities of who did what, uh, but both could potentially be in the wrong and both could be considered right. Now, if you're a cyclist and you probably know this, it doesn't matter if you're in the right or wrong, if you get hit by a car, you're gonna have more damage than the car. Um, same thing here, if that drone touched 
that uh, rotor, it could have potentially broken the helicopter and it might have crashed and harmed the occupants. So that's pretty significant. Um, never mind it crashing into the fuselage or other components of the aircraft. So it's pretty significant uh, potential catastrophe here uh, avoided really just by luck. Uh, both were operating within their parameters, both were operating under normal flight rules, but a uh, very dangerous situation. So what can be done? First, you might think that something like radar could be used. Well, let me show you what in Canada we have as the primary radar coverage. Notice that it is not comprehensive. Now there is another type of radar called secondary radar, and secondary radar has much more coverage. And secondary radar works a little bit more modern-like. Um, the primary radar, you just get a blip on the screen. Secondary radar, it's more of like asking everything a question and then they respond back themselves, giving you information about the actual aircraft. So this is the beauty of the secondary radar is it's, it's a little bit more um, in, um, information based. So it's more modern. So this is what the two screens would look like if you had a primary radar, it's just literally a blip on the screen. That might be what you have thought that uh, radar was. But the secondary radar, you can see all the digital information that's superimposed over top about every single um, blip on the screen. So secondary radar is much more comprehensive, more advanced, um, but neither of these will really pick up a uh, drone. Now before we swap over and uh, I show you that, this is what the uh, secondary radar coming into an approach path of an airport looks like. And you can see these little green squares are actually representative of airplanes and the flight controller or air traffic control here is directing the aircraft to line up for the runway uh, 06 here and then the airplane lands and comes off the radar. And then there's also airplanes taking off and they're taking off from uh, 36 left and when they take off they become airborne you get the information about the aircraft as it becomes airborne and uh, they get it, um, they're going away. So the two colors indicate if it's an arrival or departure. The other thing you'll notice every so often there's yellow bars that appear on the screen and that's helping the controller understand where two airplanes, if they continued on the path they are on, may encounter another aircraft. So it's basically like a caution saying, hey, this, air this airplane and that airplane may come too close to one another if they continue on the path they're on. So this allows the controller to make directions of each individual aircraft to avoid those conflicts. If two airplanes were going to collide, um, I believe this shows up as a red line and therefore the, uh, the air traffic controller can give immediate directions to avoid that collision. So this is what a normal screen would look like to an aircraft controller, but unfortunately our drones don't show up in either of these. Why? Well, let's start it with the uh, radar side of things. This is a radar reflector for a sailboat, and many sailboats have radar re reflectors on them if they're modern composite-based designs. So that is maybe they're all fiberglass or maybe they have no metal on them. Uh, so if they have no metal on the mass and it's made out of carbon fiber, let's say, then it won't reflect and ships have radars that are on them to watch around them. There's no real air traffic control around them. Uh, not in the sense of air traffic control. Some ports do have ship controls, sort of like air traffic control, but generally speaking, the ocean's a big open space. So they use radar reflectors on boats to be able to uh, return a very clear signature saying, hey, I am here on that primary type of radar. Now there is something like secondary radar for boats. I'm not gonna go into it. This is about drones. So just understanding that this big device is needed to be available to even return what a full sailboat potentially would be, you can see why it would be not feasible for an individual little drone to have a radar signature. It's, it's just not really possible. There is something that does exist, and it's called ADS-B, though. And ADS-B stands for Automatic uh, Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Now, instead of having this thing that is going out and asking a question or having a reflection of it, so that echo and uh, off the uh, device, this allows a device to constantly report where it is. And so ADS-B out simply says, hey, I'm here. I'm this aircraft, I'm AC-123, 
I'm at this X and Y location, I'm at this altitude, and I'm traveling at this many knots. And that way, it can transmit that information constantly, and something can receive it. And ADVS-B in allows a single device to see and hear all of these different signals that are coming out, and it will basically present that information to a pilot. And this can even be used in areas where there is no radar coverage, and it is actually getting um, implemented as a newer version of air traffic control. Now, ADS-B um, in has been proposed to be put on to the actual drones themselves as part of the software. And therefore, if it sees an aircraft coming in that's going to impact its current location, it can actually take an ev evasive maneuver for the ground operator automatically. And that way it can avoid a collision. So very, uh, very cool tech. It's not there yet, but DGI has proposed this and there's that white paper down below. So this is something that could potentially be implemented. But you need to understand how ADS works as well as something called uh, TCAS works on airplanes before you can really understand how this works. So let's, let's just go through that really briefly. First and foremost, aircraft get their, permission, uh, their position from uh, the, the GPS or GNSS constellation. So they get it from uh, the Navstar constellation and they get their X and Y location, that way they know it. And then they actively broadcast where they are. Where they are. And the ADSB also broadcasts back down to a ground station and also uh, you notice that it communicates between airplanes too, which is nice. You don't need that ground station. But the idea here is the ground station can actually be used to help control these in addition to other uh, more traditional types of radar. Now, when an airplane is flying, it uses something called TCAST to detect each other. So as soon as you're within a specific range, and it's usually about 20 nautical miles around the airplane, uh, in particular forward, it shows where that airplane is to the other pilot. So you can see these two pilots um, that green area, um, the airplane that is in the red box will have information about all airplanes around it. Now, if that other airplane starts to get into the yellow area, you get uh, an advisory. And that's uh, based not on distance, but time, because two airplanes can be traveling at close to the speed of sound. So it depends on how fast both airplanes are closing on each other or coming closer to one another and determining how um, uh, how fast you should be able to uh, make a change to the flight etc so 40 seconds out you get an advisory and what happens in the flight deck of the uh, the pilot uh, to the pilot they'll actually get a warning and it'll say traffic traffic and it'll show up a dot on a screen and I'll show you what that dot looks like in a moment now when it gets within 25 seconds so when the two airplanes are within 25 seconds of one another, that means that they will come close enough that in 25 seconds they could potentially collide. The TCAS actually issues a direction. So it allows the pilot to take evasive action. And the directions that each pilot gets are the opposite of one another. So for example, if the one airplane is coming too close and it enters the red area, um, one pilot will get descend, descend as the uh, command. So they'll be told to basically go down. The other pilot, because the two TCASs are working with each other, will decide um, climb, climb. And so that way the pilot gets an advisory to do the opposite action, therefore hopefully not colliding. And that's what this whole system was designed to do, is to avoid collisions between aircraft. Okay, so Let's take a look at some a uh, little bit of information about this. First and foremost, you can actually bring up a map of the ADSB information. So here is a map of Toronto Airport and all the flights arriving and departing right now. Now this is a live map. Um, there is a little bit of a delay. I won't talk about that, but nonetheless, the information about all these planes coming in is is live. So let's take a click onto this one airplane right here. And you'll see that's a Calgary to Toronto, and it's arriving in 10 minutes at Toronto. 
So it's in the air right now and it gives me all the information about that individual flight. This one is coming from uh, Minneapolis to Toronto and it will arrive a few minutes after that. Here's a departure. So this departure is from Toronto and it's going to YYT, which is out in, I think that's, I can't remember where YYT is actually. Uh, I think it's uh, Newfoundland and that'll arrive at 5, 11 p.m. So it's just departed. This airplane here is going to New York. This airplane up here is going to Calgary. This airplane here is going back to Toronto. And so this is every single flight going in and out of Toronto with the live information about them. So pretty cool, it even shows you the path. And if we zoom right in, you can actually see the airplanes landing uh, when they just take off. So this just took off, it's going to Vancouver. So you can get this information, and this is just a generic website, it's pulling up the ADSB information and it's bringing up that information to display it to, um, to whoever wants to see it. So uh, you can create ADSB receivers and you can uh, connect them to the internet and then feed FlightAware in this case, there's many different websites, or you can even develop your own system to display it live. So you can have something like this up just with a web connection very, very easily. It'll give you at least information about what's happening around you. It's not live um, because uh, there is a slight delay of when it gets the information, processes it, puts it on the map and displays it. So it's a couple of minutes typically. It might not be flying right over top of head. So ADSB information is available publicly because they're all broadcasting. So this is what you would see in the flight deck. So this display over here is what the instrument might look like on an airplane and it gives you different information about the airplanes. So in particular, you'll notice this first distant aircraft up here. It's just um, a diamond and that diamond is empty. And that's an airplane that's just not a threat. In this case, this is 3000 feet above you and it is descending. Here's another airplane. Now it is a little bit more concerning. It's closer. So that way the star is, or sorry, the uh, um, diamond is filled in. You can see it's 1200 feet below because they wrote negative 12 and it's climbing, the arrow is up. Now the next aircraft here is a threatening aircraft. And that means you would have got the traffic warning and it is 200 feet above you and it's climbing. But this is the one that's the most threatening right now. You can see there's red square. This is an aircraft within the advisory area. You would actually get a resolution. So it would actually say climb or descend um, to the pilot uh, because this one is going to potentially go through your airplane and that's not good. Now, if you wanna learn more about TCAS, um, you can watch this video. It's, it's how it's explained by a pilot. It gives you the exact warnings that are occurring. But for our purposes, this is enough information. Wouldn't it be nice to have the drone information embedded within this? So that's really what the proposal is here uh, by uh, DJI, is to use this type of information to be able to actually do what TCAS is doing on a drone. So it would avoid an aircraft automatically. So primary and secondary radar can't pick up drones because they're simply too small. TCAS might be a way to do that using the ADSB information and adopting these wouldn't be too difficult. DJI has already proposed it. Um, but today you could use something like FlightAware and bring that up and show it on a laptop near where you're flying and understand what's happening around you. So you can actually use this already today. Okay, so let's just talk about some basics about flying a drone. They're actually pretty simple to fly, but you need to have some basic understanding. So let's just go through some basics. First, the controller has two uh, things that you can do in any direction. So up and down on the left side is the throttle, left and right is the yaw. So the throttle is lift, it goes up or it goes down. Yaw changes um, the, uh, the orientation of the actual drone. So it'll basically rotate clockwise or counterclockwise depending on the way you turn it. Now the other side, your right side, has up and down, which is the pitch. And that literally moves the drone forward if you push it up or backwards if you move it down. Now that is backwards or forwards to the orientation of the, where the drone is facing. It might not be how you're facing. You'll see that in a moment. Now roll controls the right 
and left movement of the drone. Now, if you put all these together, you can move it anywhere you'd like. So let's take a look at a couple of scenarios. So you can see here, here's a little drone uh, image and it's moving around and you can see the red and the green lights on the actual drone showing that the orientation of the drone never changes. So that means we can use the just the one side of the joystick to draw a box that's imaginary and bring it back to the same location. So this is a very simple exercise and during the field camp you'll have the opportunity to try this out on a drone simulator. So I recommend doing this as your first action once you get it flying just to try this out to see if you can do this well and get it back to the same location. Let's do a little bit more advanced one. This one we're going to go forward, we're going to turn it around and come back, but watch when we turn it around now the forward action brings it closer to us and that's because the drone no longer is facing the same way as it was before. You've turned it around and because of that the control doesn't change its location but the drone acts as if you're still moving forward. So it's important to remember your orientation to the drone versus what you're trying to control. So using your controller um, you need to look at not only um, what button you're pressing on the controller but you need to look at where the drone is and you can use the red and green lights on it to be able to make that determination. That's why they're there. So let's take a look at that square again but this time instead of just going around in a square we're going to actually change the orientation of the drone and then move it in that direction. So we're always moving the drone forward basically we're turning the drone every single time we do that, uh, that turn at the um, edge of the square. So this is another uh, thing you can do using the simulator to really make sure that you have a good understanding of how it works. Okay, finally, a little bit more complicated operation. This requires use of both uh, sides of the controller and you can go in a circle. And I have done this with a drone. It is quite hard to do well, especially to keep a straight circle. One of the key things with flying a drone is using the controller, don't mash the controller all the way. You have to be very gentle with your actions because the drone will operate very quickly based on what action you actually give it. It's very subtle in the controls, so very rarely would you need to push it right over to the left or right up. You want to do very gentle, smooth actions with the controller to make sure it functions well. But that's the basics about flying a drone and the beauty about flying a simulator versus the real thing. You can crash it as many times as you'd like. It doesn't cost you a dime. A lot of people when they fly their drone for the first time, they end up crashing within the first month and it can be quite expensive an endeavor to not only fix your drone or replace your drone completely. And when there are thousands of dollars, that adds up pretty quickly. So in field camp we're not going to be flying real drones we're only going to be flying simulators and that's it for uh, the lecture component with drones I hope you found that uh, not only a little bit entertaining but uh, insightful and I encourage you to try out getting your basic uh, operators certificate with uh, Transport Canada so you can actually explore more about drones thank you